This is the latest in a series of documentaries from the Bulletin with UBS on Monocle 24. In this very special episode of the programme, we're once again gathering Nobel perspectives from some of those brilliant laureates in economic sciences with whom UBS works to shine a light on the complexities and challenges of a fast-changing world. Today we're asking, can economics help the fight against climate change? We'll hear from an extraordinary array of laureates, Bengt Holmström, Michael Spence, Richard Thaler and Eric Maskin, each of whom can leverage a wealth of experience, expertise and intellectual rigour to drive the discourse in this area of critical global importance. We begin with Bent Holmström, 2016 Nobel Laureate in Economic Sciences, an expert on contract theory and a man for whom much of his life's work has focused on providing the right incentives to people, mostly at work but elsewhere too. Economics, after all, regardless of the area in which you're working, is very often about incentives for businesses or individuals. With more environmental economists today, the question of providing the right incentives to help the fight against climate change is very much on the table. Bengt Holmström takes up the story. We all are part of the planet. Anything I do good for, for the environment will benefit everybody else. And so the issue is... What incentive do I have to do what is the socially valuable thing, which is think about the value for everybody. I'm a little surprised at some level that young people haven't really sort of taken this as their big thing and pressed the older generations, the companies and so on, on the various forms of pollution. I'm certain the companies will follow suit if there is enough pressure and Companies will react to that if it shows up on their bottom line. It's much more difficult to get them to sacrifice some on the bottom line because the investors won't like that. Will companies in the future pay more attention to environmental concerns? Impact investing, meaning investments that are not only made with the intention to generate financial returns, but with the motivation to have a positive social and environmental impact, is a rapidly growing strategy. If the majority of investors start directing capital to companies that actually generate those social and environmental benefits, pure profit maximisation could become a thing of the past. Michael Spence was named Nobel Laureate in Economic Sciences in 2001 in recognition of his work on labour economics and information flows. In recent years, Spence has focused more on economic growth and development. I think we are paying more attention to impact investing and that's true of investors and it's true of companies as well. I mean, I think there's a major transition underway to maximize the return to the shareholders isn't the model anymore. It's rapidly turning into a kind of multi-stakeholder creating shared value model, which is a very good thing because I don't see how we tackle problems like climate change without that kind of evolution. It's not something where you can do it all with policy. You need shifts in value, shifts in behavior, shifts in models. If you have a big change in values and people change their investment behavior in large numbers, that actually changes the cost of capital even in the public markets. I think that doesn't get a whole lot of attention because that doesn't seem like it's likely to happen anytime soon. But over time, you can imagine something like that going on. If you're investing according to your values 15 years from now, it may be part of the majority. In 2018, the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences was shared between Paul Romer and William Nordhaus. Nordhaus, a professor of economics at Yale University, is best known for integrating climate change into economic analysis. He's often argued in favour of carbon taxation. There are relatively few things most economists agree upon, but this should be one of them. Certainly, Bengt Holmström believes so. I believe in taxation. It's both positive in the sense that if you if you grow more trees that absorb a carbon footprint, then you should be rewarded for it. If you spew out carbon monoxide into the atmosphere and other pollutants, then you should pay for it. That's a very old principle, but to the extent you can measure these things, and you can measure him, many of these things, that's what you should do. An essential step then? For Michael Spence, certainly. Nordhaus has persistently argued, and I think correctly, that some version of taxing carbon is an essential step in dealing with climate change. But whether it's going to happen politically is very difficult to understand. So far, we've made a little progress. We have carbon trading systems which are a kind of substitute or an alternative to taxing carbon, but it's by no means ubiquitous. And the United States federal government's going the opposite direction. Once you get below that, everybody's going their own way. 
Richard Thaler, the 2017 laureate and behavioural economist who's long focused on decision making, agrees. It's dangerous when we have politicians who deny the overwhelming evidence of science. And obviously we have that problem currently in the United States, but I don't think it's unique to us. But what should we do about it? There's no one silver bullet. The closest thing we have comes from traditional economics. If there's something bad, raise the price. Most places tax alcohol and cigarettes. We should be taxing carbon. Thaler famously coined the term nudging in a book he wrote together with Cass Sunstein, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth and Happiness. The two introduced the concept of choice architecture, arguing that people need structure in order to make decisions, and therein lies the opportunity to create structures that lead people to make better decisions. Can people be nudged into more green behaviour as well? So that's step one. Let's raise the price of using the thing that's causing harm. But there are technology and behavioural enhancements that can work well around the edges. Modern thermostats help. You could imagine a thermostat that on a hot day when you turn the thermostat down a degree or two, it says, this is going to cost you $10. You know, it's up to you. <laughs> Go for it. With the use of proper framing, we could remind people how glorious our planet is. Advertising works. And so the same strategies that firms use to get you to buy their products could be employed to nudge people to keep the planet going a little bit longer. Images of icebergs the size of small countries falling off the Antarctica and Arctic may help. These are all little things, but the only way we're going to deal with climate change is get the price right and then a lot of little things. Michael Spence points towards the fact that economic growth, especially in developing countries, has a major environmental impact and needs to be considered when looking for better levels of energy efficiency. Whether we're winning the race or not is a different question because we have a, I think the thing is not completely well understood. The majority of the world's population lives in countries that are growing. Well, if that's 85% of the world's population, that's a fairly big increment to the global economy. So you have to have pretty massive increases in energy efficiency and reductions in the carbon intensity of the energy mix in order just to compensate for that growth. That is to stand still, let alone decline. Are there particular areas of geographic or developmental focus for Bengt Holmström? China is very important. Even if the rest of the world wouldn't do anything, China will have to do something because they are having a hard time breathing. And so they have an incentive they are already in a situation where the environmental damage is so bad that they, they will do it for their own right. And how would the mechanics of the process work? How does Michael Spence characterise regulation and innovation in this space? A carbon tax would be top down, a regulation would be top down, but bottom up means innovation. It means changing your behaviour based on shifting values. It means educational programs so people actually think it's important. It means recycling stuff. It means a lot of things. The progress we've made is, I think, in the engagement area. I mean, people really are in very large numbers engaged. There, there must be tens and tens of thousands of people who are in one way or another directly working on this. And that's good and it's essential. Nobel laureate in economic sciences in 2007 was Eric Maskin. He spent a bigger part of his academic career trying to figure out ways in which mechanism design theory, his area of expertise, can be used to achieve social goals. I went to college at a time uh, considerable political and social unrest. This was the late 60s, early 70s. And I think it was pressed on us all that we had an obligation 
to think not only about our our careers, but also about important issues facing the world. And I realized that economics was one way of doing that. Economics gives you the tools to think about social and economic problems in a coherent and consistent and quite revealing way. Mechanism design is what I like to think of as the engineering part of economics. We start with outcomes. We say these are the outcomes we would like to have, and then we work backwards to figure out a, a mechanism or an, an institution which will generate those outcomes. One of the applications of mechanism design for Maskin has been climate change and energy efficiency. Climate change is not likely to lead to disaster in the next few years, although we are already beginning to see the possible repercussions. But there is a significant risk that if we do nothing, it will lead to catastrophic outcomes down the road. And the reason we've got ourselves into the climate change box is that we've been burning fossil fuels, and that's heating up the world. If we are to solve the problem of fossil fuel burning, we have to find an alternative to these forms of energy that is viable on a large scale. We can't expect purely private markets to give us clean air. There, there's no place where we can go to buy clean air. Instead, you need government to step in and limit the amount of pollution. You want to introduce a pollution policy which is efficient. That is, you want a policy so that those polluters who can most cheaply reduce their pollution levels are given the incentive to reduce as much as possible. And those polluters for whom reductions are more expensive, they're not going to have to reduce so much. That is, you want to direct your pollution reduction to the polluters who are most able to make those reductions. You can't distinguish the high cost polluters from the low cost polluters. And so you have to develop mechanisms for ensuring that those different classes of polluters get identified in the process of the mechanism. So uh, environmental policy has been an important application of, of mechanism design. Eric Maskin. The human impact on the environment is the topic of the century and plans to mitigate the effects are on the table all around the globe. With the number of environmental economists on the rise, are we closer to a solution? Michael Spence, although unsure whether we will win the race, says that economists are going to play a huge role in further shaping policies directed towards the environmental goal. We live in an era in which, to some extent, expertise of any kind you know, is being rejected. But I do think that economics evolves. So at no point in time could you say the economics profession's got all the right models or all the right solutions. But it evolves and I think it will make a contribution. Michael Spence there, concluding another stellar contribution of his own to this latest Nobel Perspectives edition of the Bulletin with UBS on Monocle 24. To read more from and about the laureates and to discover how Nobel perspectives shape the UBS worldview, head to ubs.com forward slash Nobel. Keep an eye and an ear on this program in the weeks and months ahead as we enjoy more access to the brilliant insights of the Nobel laureates. More special episodes and documentaries are in store. But if that's just too long to wait, why not dip into a great mix of videos and articles at the UBS Nobel Hub. The Bulletin with UBS on Monocle 24. Are you interested in learning more about female leaders in economics? 
UBS, in partnership with independent non-profit network the Centre for Economic Policy Research, brings you Women in Economics, an expansion of the bank's ongoing Nobel Perspectives programme. We'll be featuring Women in Economics on future editions of this show, but you can find out more right now. Head to ubs.com forward slash W-I-E.